so I've been working on this project for a while. It's, it's not live yet. Um, and, and when I heard about WordCamp Nordic, I was like, this is, I thought this is interesting. This is an, an unusually interesting project for me. Um, and it occurred to me immediately that it'd be cool to come and talk about this. So thanks for having me here. Um, I've been doing software for a long time, but I want to get into the context of this particular exercise, which is for a Finnish company called Finlayson. Finns will, will know this company. Many Nordics will probably be aware of this. Um, coming up to 200 years old, James Finlayson was a, a Quaker from Scotland who came to Finland and basically effectively brought the Industrial Revolution to Finland. Uh, if you can go to Tampere, you can see the old factories and buildings that he built at the time. Uh, these days, they're like movie theaters and, and museums and things like that. And Finlayson makes textile products uh, their new stuff is, is uh, coming out now. They have a lot of Mumi, Mumin character-based things, and they've licensed uh, Tom of Finland. Uh, the, the purpose of, of mentioning this, of course, is for general context, but also that they sell internationally. Um, Japanese love Mumin products, and so when Finlayson licenses the Mumin characters, um, then they sell pretty well in Japan and elsewhere. They have... Um, some many thousands of products in total. Historically, they're not necessarily on sale anymore, as well as uh, the current selection of products that you can find from their online store or in, uh, in, in their uh, physical stores. And, and they use this system called Perfion. It's a Danish company. Uh, there are others. This is a good one. I'm not specifically experienced in, in these product information management systems. Um, for those that don't know what this is or what it, what it means, if you imagine that you have uh, products that you sell, physical products, uh, like a bathrobe, three different colors, three different sizes, and then you have towels in many colors and bed sheets and things, you need a way to manage all of that information. And I have seen this done using, for example, Google Sheets. Turns out Google Sheets has a two million cell upper limit. Um, you hit that and it's annoying. <laughs> no, so, you know, after a certain point, you, you need uh, a system to manage the data properly, including things like internationalization and, and translations. When you have a product named in three languages, you may have product images that are language specific. Uh, if you have a picture of a bathrobe, well, you know, it's probably the same. Uh, this more applies to things like marketing images where it'll contain some text. Uh, but it can apply to product information. You can have a, a picture of a product that is tied to a language, just like the textual description or name of the product might be tied to a particular language. And so Perfion is, is the product information management system that is being used and, and where all the information is pulled out from and where it is managed internally. Uh, the quotes, that's just this is straight from their website. Um, I, I, it wasn't appropriate to pull up an actual screenshot from their live system. Other parts of the context where, where we work, uh, there are currently the consumer stores, finlayson.fi, finlayson.se, and the international store at uh, finlaysonshop.com run on Shopify. And their ERP, which manages all inventories, prices, orders, customer information, is Microsoft uh, Dynamics Nav. This is just for background. Um, it's a whole separate interesting story to discuss integration to these systems as well. But in this context, what's missing from uh, Finlayson and, and what we started to to think about, uh, so the problem that we had to solve was uh, we need an online store for corporate customers. The, the absolute volumes of this are uh, quite significant uh, in addition to the consumer st sales in uh, online stores and in uh, brick and mortar stores. If uh, there are visitors here and go to downtown Helsinki, uh, there's a cool flagship store on Esplanadi. And these customers, again, you know, back to the language thing, uh, of course, Finland is important. Uh, you can go to Esplanadi and there's the Moomin shop. You go in there, there's the Finlayson Moomin themed products. Um, Sweden, of course, is part of the EU, but Sweden has a bit of a special place here. Then the rest of the EU, uh, Sweden, for example, does not work in uh, Euro currency. Uh, we also use uh, WPL multi-currency. It's not a topic for today, but was part of this problem overall. And the customization requirements are very different in this case of corporate customers than for B2C stores. Um, 
they come from different places, there are different customer groups, the, the, the selection of products out of the entire product set that Finlayson has and, and produces and sells at any moment uh, does vary based on country, based on like weird things I don't even know about, uh, brand license restrictions, for example. Finlayson uses uh, Tomo Finland, uh, Moomin, uh, there's been some uh, WWF work done previously, etc. Um, and there are all kinds of like strange rules that apply to these and, and these have to be uh, considered. And of course, specifically, uh, the language issue is important that for Finns, uh, for the Finnish corporate customers, it's, it's extremely important that they can do their business in Finnish. It, it's, it's not, I mean, yeah, Finns always know English, but it's important uh, in a B2B relationship that the customers can work in their native language. Same applies to Sweden. Um, and the rest of the world, they just get English. So you yeah, have to draw the line somewhere. Um, and so given this situation, we needed to decide on, well, so what are you going to do about this? Um, Previously, before, before I was involved and before this project got going, um, Magento as, 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 a, as a platform choice was considered um, and was not chosen. I, I don't have much more to say about that. Um, although I do want to point out that no platform has like built-in multilingual support in its core. Which, like, I'm, I'm looking at all the people now that work on WordPress and WooCommerce and all the Magento developers, and like, that would be great. Because, like, as a general comment, um, it's kind of a problem. Multilingual support is always overlaid in some way. Maybe it's done well, maybe it's done not so well. Um, but there's no obviously good choice from a platform or technology perspective. Um, and so it, the, the end result was, you know, this, this Goldilocks of too cold, too, you know, too hot, ah, just right, was uh, you know, the WordPress uh, as a technology basis and specifically WooCommerce with the multilingual features enabled on top. You, know, you get a basic store, we can do all the customizations we need for shipping methods and special payment methods and credit limit checking and, and whatnot, and we can do the multilingual thing. Uh, we evaluated Shopify, and, and Shopify has a, a, a basic restriction that they're one language at a time. You can get like a multilingual overlay, it's doable, there's plugins, we, we kind of looked at them, but it seemed more of a pack than WPML. I think it's WPML shirts, I think, is the green one multilingual or I've seen some jumpers which say multilingual, so I'm wondering, if, is, is there staff here? If there is, you know, let me know and we can talk. So, what we ended up with was, was this. Uh, we set up WooCommerce, we uh, used the WooCommerce multilingual plugin, and then the WPML uh, basic translation core. And, well, just out of curiosity, I mentioned some others that we use, not that it's important in this context, and the, the, the DevOps, the previous presenter, Interesting, thank you. Uh, we do most of those things. Um, we use a Git flow. We use WordMove to move the database back and forth. Um, interestingly, we have um, about uh, 200,000 files in the uploads folder because we were a little bit lazy with uh, like managing thumbnail creation. There's a bit of unnecessary thumbnail creation that we don't always need. Uh, but the product imagery overall is a couple of hundred gigabytes of images because we do also, for unrelated reasons, we also maintain the original full-size TIFFs, which vary in size starting from 80 megabytes up to a gigabyte each, um, plus then you know, generated thumbnails and, and um, special preview images. Uh, you can imagine a, a shower curtain is tall and narrow. We need to create a square image which has like white filled in on the sides. And so all the imagery gets multiplied crazily. Maybe might have to do something about it at some point. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, you know, it was interesting to hear your presentation. Uh, there was some good uh, pointers, which I'll be picking up for our development. Anyway, to proceed to the multilingual thing, to get the product information from Perfion, from the product information management system, into the store is, on the one hand, it's a one-off operation when we start and, and we deploy the store, but that's not interesting. It happens once, then on an ongoing basis, it must be updated constantly. Uh, the product information is actually updated daily within the company. Spelling mistakes may be corrected, uh, texts may be changed, and new products are created. Because in addition to having the current product selection in Perfion, in the product information management system, also like upcoming products that are not on sale yet, so they're not public, you can't see them anywhere, but they're also managed and maintained and they are previewed in the system by staff. 
And, and so those things like, you know, there may be a photography day where product photos are taken and then those get updated, uploaded today. And then tomorrow, you know, somebody brings in all the Swedish translations. So we need an ongoing system for, for daily updates. And we're thinking also to write an external script, uh, you know, the, the integration component should, should you know, how, how do, where do we put it? Do we have an external script that we run uh, with cron that doesn't have to be programmed in PHP at all? Um, or what do we do? And, and considering that there's already an extensive list of customizations, you know, for the, for the store to work in the first place, um, it, it seemed inconsistent and, and an extra complexity to have like something very different for this part. And so we wrote it as a plugin, um, but it's important to notice that we, we don't actually run the synchronization itself, you know, from the admins. That we don't press a sync button in the dashboard or have any automation there, because then you're subject to the timeouts um, and usage restrictions, memory restrictions and timeouts, because the sync can run for hours. So it make, makes no sense, like, turn off all your timeouts and ex expand your memory use limits to like a gigabyte um, within that context. But you can run a sync from the admin console, from the dashboard, uh, because sometimes we want to do a fast update. We'll modify the configuration parameters and say, okay, now we want just these five products, bring them in quickly. And it can be convenient to be able to trigger a sync from the dashboard. But primarily, we uh, run an external script using the, the, uh, the command line interface, and it runs on a, on a cron task nightly, and it has unlimited memory access. Uh, it, has, uh, it can run for as long as it likes. Things like converting images, you need to load the image into memory in order to create a, a JPEG preview. Uh, we, we do our own JPEG previews, not always building on, on the, the WordPress built-in thumbnail generation. And if you have a gigabyte-sized image, you, know, you need to have enough memory allocated to the process to read in the gigabyte image, and, and then it can create the, this small preview. So, actually bringing in the data from the information management system. Um, Perfion, in this particular case, offers two APIs. They're very similar. The first is a generic one, which, you know, historically they implemented first. Um, it is generic, you, you get access to all the product information, but it also provides no sort of um, online store related features. It doesn't help you very much. It's uh, basically, uh, I have some examples. Uh, XML based and kind of inspired by SQL statements and so you can do queries into the data and pull out that which you need. And they have an e-commerce oriented API which for example allows you to define channels. Uh, in Finlayson's case for example we have this B2B channel which allows you to set certain rules on well what products will be pulled out, uh, which languages will be included in the data, um, which product features, what product data specifically is brought out, which can be different from the consumer store for Finland or for the Swedish consumer store or for the international consumer store. There's actually seven Shopify stores that we run because there's Finland, Sweden, international. For each, we have a test store where we can test things. And then there's like a sandbox store where we play around with things. So we actually have eight different e-commerce channels defined, uh, each with their own different configurations so that we can get different controlled subsets of the product information into these different stores. In Perfion, you can, you can organize your product information into a, a structure of product and variation. Like, you know, you have your bathrobe and it's in three colors and three sizes, but it's kind of the same bathrobe, just in various variations. Um, you can build that straight into the data and then you kind of don't need this, but uh, often that's not the case because the data originates from sales and, 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 and the design people and, and procurements and, and they don't organize the data in the way that the online store needs. Um, so using the e-commerce API, you kind of overlay that structure on top. And I, I wanted to specifically get into some of, some of this technical stuff because this is some of the, uh, you know, th these are the things that I found most specifically interesting that I wanted to share with you guys here today. Uh, the generic API is XML based. It um, is loosely oriented around uh, SQL. And so in this, in this example, we're saying, give me Finnish, English, and Swedish content. Um, it may or may not exist. And so one problem that we face is sometimes if they forget to put in like a, the Swedish text, like, well, what do we do now? And there's nothing really you can do because if the Swedish text is missing and you need to publish this information to the Swedish store, 
like you can't generate it here. I mean, you can flag it and stuff like that. Um, in our case, we, we default to finish. It's not great, but, but you gotta have something rather than nothing. Um, so for finish is always our default in the case of missing data. We ask for these languages, we say feature ID and asterisk, and say, well, give me everything. Just for this demo, I'm saying, give me everything. We don't really do this normally because there's about 600 features defined. Um, you get a lot of stuff. And I'm saying in this example, just give me this one product. In our daily synchronization, we don't say give me one product, we say give me this defined subset of everything and we'll get typically about 1,500 products in one run. We asked for three languages, and so in the response, the first part of the response is metadata on the product. What is the um, information about the features that we're going to get? And so I highlighted, it's not actually a great example, but you can see each is repeated three times because there's English, Finnish, Swedish. Uh, the ID is the same, this 1752, it's the same feature, marketing text. Um, but it's in three languages, um, and, and the, uh, you don't get content here yet, but this feature is called product type in English, and prototype in Finnish, and prototype in Swedish. And in this particular example, there's actually 2,000 lines of stuff, because we have about 600 features, each is in three languages, and so you know, you, it all multiplies out crazily. Next part of the response is the actual product information. You can see it's a product internal ID. It shows um, in the first line the value says it's the SKU, which is not localized. It's just once. So it doesn't have a different product code in English and Swedish and Finnish. It's always the same. Uh, there's a barcode somewhere. Well, for example, the designer year. You can see it halfway through. It's just once. So that's not in three languages. That exists. That's not a localizable feature. It's just a one language feature. It's a number. And so it comes through once, barcode once, designer year once. But for example, product title, we can see here, here in English, it says thingami and Bob bath towel. It's a mummy character. I don't know how to pronounce the Swedish one. I don't know Swedish. Um, so that's the product type. And then we have this is the generic API. So there's no structuring of product and variation and, and what are the parameters on which the variations vary, like size and color. Um, but this is used in, in certain contexts, and especially for debugging, this can be great. The similar query using the e-commerce API is, is more oriented now towards an actual web store. We can say, uh, get products, we say, what channel? So which store are we asking for? It could give us the B2B configuration, uh, and that will give us certain values. It says, include mappings, is asterisk. We will get those mappings that are defined for the B2B store. Mappings means uh, what feature data we get, what product information is actually given out of the, of the 600 features total that we have for each product. Uh, we want some for this store. And then we say, you know, here's the product code. Again, for this example, it's just a single code I'm asking for. Normally, you know, we'll say, give us 1,500 at a time. We actually batch it into about 50 or 100 at a time. We don't actually pull out 1,500. It, the system times out if you try. And then the result, again, is organized more in a more structured way. Uh, this product has fields, and this is on the product level. So again, to take the example of a bathrobe, which has three colors and three sizes, each of the, that creates nine different variations, each having a particular color and a particular size, but then they all share much of the same product information in general. And so this is that general product information. We can see body HTML, specifically oriented to the web store, but here's how the product description, you know, the content for the product description. So in WooCommerce, that becomes literally one-to-one. -one. That's the product description field. Uh, the title, what is the name of the product, etc. But again, key, for example, is not in three languages because, because that value does not vary by language. And here you can accidentally see some custom stuff we have that this is um, sell only to countries. So there is some license restriction saying that uh, Finlayson is not permitted to sell this product uh, to certain countries. I have no idea why, like I don't know, <laughs> I don't, I don't, don't know more about that, but it, it was a requirement. Um, and so that's part of the product information. This product may not be sold to other countries, and so if a customer of the B2B web store logs in, we, we know who they are, we know what company they're associated with, they log in as an individual, but they're associated with a certain business customer who is you know, officially located as a Finnish customer or 
Chilean customer or from Thailand or Japan, and then based on that, we, uh, we do filter. Not multilingual specific, but because it shows up here. We also get information on, so for this product, what are the ways in which the variations vary? Yeah, I don't know why the size came twice. It's a weird bug I noticed it just this morning. But here we're being told that this product has variations, and they will vary based on size and color. Somebody who does cars, you know, it'll vary on engine size, and, and, and if you do screws, you'll vary on thread counts and things, right? But for textiles, it's typically always color and size. We get this information, and again, in three languages, so that when we show the information on the web store, we can use the right language to, to, to say what we're talking about. Interestingly, the <laughs> Swedish translation seems to be missing for, for color. And so it defaults to the, the technical name, the internal name. Somebody has to fix that soon. Then the variants have information. For example, uh, the thread count, ironing instructions, they may vary. Like you have a t-shirt in three colors, the black has special washing instructions, but the others have different washing instructions. So in addition to varying by color, the variations may have different information. Um, images, again, images can be localized. You can have a, an English image and a Finnish image and a Swedish image. In this particular case, we don't really have that very much. At Finlayson, they're always the same. But this multilingual feature of Perfion applies to all features, including images. And if there were, for example, different Finnish, Swedish, and English uh, product images, then they would be represented uh, as, as multiple image uh, elements here. On the first one, you can see these bytes, uh, the, the actual, what's it, base64 encoded content comes through here. We made that choice. It's just technically slightly convenient. The JPEG images are not very big, so it's kind of okay for them to come through directly. It makes the request, the response is quite large, but it's convenient. But then the, the main images, which I think here you can see there's the TIFF image.tif, um, we're like, you know, if you want this image, come get it from this URL. <laughs> we don't base encode those into the response. And then we say, this one, this particular product is, its color is dark blue, and its size is this thing. We localize the size because mostly it's always the same. But by localizing the size, we enable using commas or uh, full stops, periods, as the decimal, which is kind of neat. Um, and when you have like one size is a size, we can say that in, in three languages. Um, if it were just a centimeter number, a whole number, we wouldn't need to localize the size, but, but we do localize the actual size information as well. All right, so this is the information that comes out of the, uh, the product system. Now we need to put it into the store. And I was wondering, maybe people may or may not be familiar with this already, but I had to put this in that the way WooCommerce works um, as an extension of WordPress is that a main product, like a bathrobe, is a custom post type. Um, and there's some taxonomy terms which identify what kind of product it is. It can be simple, grouped, variable, and there's a fourth which I don't remember, external or something. But in our case, always variable. It's always like a bathrobe, three sizes, three colors, or like a pillow in two sizes, or things like that. And then the variations, again, are a custom post type, and their parent post, um, post parent indicates uh, where they belong. And again, there's more taxonomies to indicate, like, so what is the size, what is the color, um, and we, we transfer information of the, the variations into the appropriate WooCommerce taxonomies so that they are displayed properly in, in the right language. But this is just for one language. What, you know, whatever the default WordPress WooCommerce installation is. Uh, in our case, we use the WooCommerce multilingual plugin, which builds upon the WPML things, and it just duplicates everything. And when I, when I first ran across this a few years back when I started working on this, I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, why, you know, why don't we build them in? Like, but, but the other option is also not good. If you start trying to bake in multiple languages into the same post type. Well, first of all, WordPress doesn't really allow that. Right? You, you can't really do that. I have no idea about Magento or Shopify or anything. This is just the way you have to do it. And it's fine. But you do get a lot of entries in your, in your tables. Everything is, is triplicated. All attachments are triplicated, if, uh, triplicate because we have three languages. Um, but it works. Uh, each of the, on each level, 
the, the, the product level bathrobe, Google Doc, Kibadrock, they, they have a translation ID which ties them together, so we know which is the translation of which. And one is always the source language. It doesn't make a big difference to the end user, they don't see anything, but technically we know which was the original, and then these are translations of that. Um, and the same applies to all variations. Um, so you get love entries, which is fine. We only have about, for example, in one particular instance of a store, we have about 1,200 products, but like our post ID count is already like 200,000, just, just from our development of products in, products out, develop, update, you know, and then the, the counter keeps going, so you get into big numbers. Um, but it works. So thank you to all the WPML contributors. It's a good system. And then, finally, some comments on, on actually creating the products. This is where there was some challenges because WooCommerce has a good PHP, uh, a PHP function API for getting information. So if you're writing a, a plugin like we do, uh, you can get information, you can load a product, you can ask for the children, you can get the information, but there's nothing for creating programmatically. There's some extensions to the WP REST API so that if you're calling the REST API for externally, you can say, uh, create a product, create a variation. Um, but we decided not to do that. It wasn't a good decision, I'm not quite sure. But you know, we wanted to do the coding in the plugin. Uh, same thing for the multilingual stuff. WPML itself plus the uh, WCML, which is the WooCommerce multilingual. Also, there's no uh, set of PHP functions for creating stuff. Um, so everything that... I know now has been basically reverse engineered because there's also no, no documentation for this. The only thing I've not done is I've not actually been specifically in contact with the WPML or WCML teams, maybe I should now, but um, you know, looking online for information, uh, people ask about this and then the moderators on the WPML, WCML forums like, yeah, we don't have that. Okay, so I've been digging around in the database. I mean, now I know how it works. Uh, because I reverse engineered the whole thing, and I'm thinking, you know, if I want to be rich and famous, now I need to write like a library which does this. Uh, it would be awesome. I, I, would, I would pay a lot of money, I would, and I won't charge my customer that money, uh, to someone who writes a, a code library for writing, creating products in WooCommerce and doing it multilingually. That would be really valuable because we spend a lot of time having to do it ourselves by reverse engineering it. A final comment on, on the synchronization process that we run. It's relatively straightforward, but it was not obvious like doing it. You know, it's obvious now that we <coughs> now that I can write it here. But it took us a while to kind of figure out what makes sense. Um, we, we find first what are the products that we want in this particular store. Um, it's, it's always a subset of, of everything. It's, it's never everything. It's always some things. For example, upcoming products that are not public yet. Of course, we don't want those. Historical products not being produced anymore. No point. Uh, we do a fast prefetch because performance can be a problem. Talking to the Perfion API, uh, sometimes you have to do everything within about 60 seconds or it, it complains. Uh, so we ask for, give us all the IDs based on that um, and the SKUs, the product codes. Then we just do a simple comparison. We say, well, what products do we know in our store now? And then what are the products that we're supposed to have? And we just compare them. Say, well, here's all, you know, there's new products that we don't know about. Okay, we need to create these products. And then we have products in the store which are not included in this query response, so you've got to delete these products because they're going away. And then the rest we update. For boring reasons, we can't use last modified timestamps, which is really annoying, which means that we always update everything, because we don't actually know what has changed. You want to know why? Come and ask afterwards. Uh, which is why the database, the, 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 this process runs for about three to six hours. We do it nightly and it's fine, and we might need to make it better later, but it's okay for now and using the awesomeness of the uh, WP command line interface, uh, we wrote this as a plugin. So we get to use all the WordPress and WCML and WPML features uh, and utility functions, um, but then we use like you know, a gigabyte of memory and it runs for five hours. We can run it outside. Um, I'm only recently familiar with WP CLI, so I'm enthusiastic about it because it was very cool. We had trouble with timeouts in the dashboard previously. But that's, uh, that's it from my side. Thank you. Hold on for a second. You have time for questions. First of all, thank you. It, 
triggered me a little bit more, but I'm still kind of, what the hell is going on? At least I know Are that it's, open? yeah, yeah at least I know too. that it's really hard to have multilingual uh, online store. I do get yeah, that. Really yeah. <laughs> and I kind of appreciate that you was kind of telling the, the points that you had when developing that kind of sites. So we, now we have time for questions. Yeah, go for it. Hello. I have two questions, actually. Um, the first one is how did you manage with that amount of uploads? How did you manage to work with it efficiently, uh, like going from local to a staging to a production? Because, I mean, obviously you, you, you take the, the files from production and, and down, but if you have like hundreds of gigs, uh, that's uh, a nightmare, isn't it? Yes. How did you manage? The great pain and suffering. <laughs> <laughs> we have 235,000 files, uh, 233 gigabytes, and we use WordMove, which is basically our sync, to move it around, and it's really painful. Um, having said that, just a sec, um, the, the delta from day to day is not huge, right? So once upon a time, I ran WordMove, I synced everything down to this laptop right here, which is a, has a, has, it was maxed out years ago, it has a terabyte on it, and I had to like clean up a huge amount of space, which was very annoying, because it's also my personal laptop. So I had to make like 250 gigabytes of space, and then I synced everything down, and it ran for about a week. And then I had everything from Perfion. I was like, great, now it's on my laptop. And it took another week to push it up to our um, staging environments, and, and, and then it took an, another week to go to production. So it, I, I spent about three weeks with my laptop open, charged online all the time, just, and it was, I would go into work and come home, and, and, and my laptop was always open and it was in my car, and, and it was ridiculous. But now that it's done, the delta from day to day is not bad. But rsync does struggle hugely. Uh, it fails uh, mostly. I only get successful rsync about once every five times that I run it. It's, it's a problem. It's not a big problem that the consumer is like, oh my goodness, this doesn't work, or my customer is happy. But yeah, it, it, it's a problem for us. Sounds tedious. Horrible. The end result is fine, right? So it's worth it. But yeah, this, this is annoying. Uh, my other question is, um, how come you chose WPML as uh, multilingual? Um, and and uh, the, the, the background is that um, I myself has actually been sued for, for uh, and lost in court uh, for using W, uh, or I, we, had, uh, we helped the client who had WPML, uh, WPML and uh, there were bugs in WPML, and if uh, anyone else has used WPML, you know that there are lots of them in WPML. Um, because the code is a bit wonky, um, as you might have noted. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, how is it working out for you? Because like the judge said, hey, Jimmy, um, you know, if you're an expert in, in, uh, in WordPress, you should probably know that uh, you shouldn't use this. I was like, <clears throat> and you should have better. What was the trouble you had with it? I mean, apart from you know, technical issues, uh, what's well, this legal thing? Well, um, Hmm, what can I say? Uh, the, the main problem was that uh, the client did not understand that, you know, uh, in open source, uh, no one is really responsible for, for the end product. You, you, yeah. I mean, you sell your time mm -hmm. and to help them customize, but uh, uh, in court, the judge did not agree. It was uh, the judge considered it uh, a product, and we should know better, probably. So uh, now we, we use... Um, we use a multilingual press uh, mm. instead, and uh, I would say that uh, it is a much better solution, and it has never caused us any issues. Okay. Uh, uh, good to know. Maybe I'll use that next time. I, we use WPML because, honestly, a good friend recommended it, said this is great. And I, was like, I trust him, he's my colleague, and, and it was fine. Yeah, okay. Uh, re with regard to open source components and technical issues and bugs and things, um, I have always made it clear to all my customers, like, ever, that we're going to use open source. I highly recommend using open source. If you don't use open source, here's the, you know, here's the alternative cost. For, I'm going to recode this whole thing. You know, so you make it clear that it is a good idea to use open source. But hey, you know, if there are bugs, I'm not responsible. No, yeah. Right? Uh, and I put that into the contract, and I make sure that the customer understands what's happening. So not just fine print that they don't get. I make it completely clear. Um, so far, my customers, I believe, have understood this. And it's baked into the contract explicitly. Yeah. If there is a defect in the open source components. I am not responsible. 
But I, I do contractually obligate myself to do my best to A, fix it right, in the actual component itself. That would be great. Cool, I get to contribute. Or to develop a workaround. But I will charge by the hour for that. And if it doesn't work, I'm like, sorry. Yeah, right? So I always, I always cover my back from that perspective. Yeah. It has not been a problem, but I'm, I, yeah. I hope to be prepared for this case. Yeah, we had a lot of uh, problems with the checkout and, and you know, small okay. things that didn't work and broke. Okay. And I was, it don't was, look it was forward bad. to seeing those myself. Hopefully I won't see them. Yes. Anyway, next guys, there's a couple of hands at least. That I think you were first and, and then here and then here. Thank you, it was very interesting. Uh, regarding the images, uh, we, have a <clears throat> we have a client where we import uh, daily or many times they used cars that they sell. And uh, then it, of course, results in heavy, really much images on the, on the, on the production server. So what we do on, on, on our devs, dev environment is that we have in our HD access file so that it, if it doesn't find the image locally, it just loads that image from the live site instead so that I don't have to ever take the uploads to my local. We have on paper with my colleague, we have designed and, and planned to implement. Once it becomes too painful, um, we'll probably move the whole uploads into uh, an Amazon S3 bucket and link to it from everywhere. Yep. It causes different kinds of problems then because, you're, because all environments share it and is it in sync and you're kind of exchanging one problem for a different problem. Right now we struggle with the word move rsync thing because even though it's problematic, when the rsync does go through, we're cleanly separated in our environments and we don't have weird side effects. I just need to retry all the time and, and like, you know, every few days I get a full sync and then, and then we're good. And, and then I wanted to ask, uh, do you, two questions, do you run the loading, the import script on the same server as you host it or on a different server? You run on the same server. Okay. And uh, but then that's just an accident. Uh, we don't need to do elsewise. Uh, when and if we need to, uh, we'll run it separately. Okay. And then have you ever encountered where you need to have different product images per country instead of per language? No. Okay. But the solution we have for filtering products based on customer, based on customers, customer group probably you know, we would be able to adapt to that. So, so no, we haven't done that, but I think that the stuff we've done probably would be straightforwardly expandable to, to, to do that. We've done something very similar. Okay, thank you. Down there. Uh, so first of all, thank you for a good talk, and I feel sorry for you having to work on SOAP APIs, I feel you. Um, so client is yeah, I'm probably just having my own opinions on it. I'm not going to do them now. Uh, secondly, do you, did you have any problems regarding to like performance and issues regarding that? I'm yes. thinking it's a big site, uh, and how did you solve them? If you could give an example. Um, the biggest performance problem we had was um, a bug in WooCommerce, which is going to be fixed soon. I don't remember the numbers and the codes, but it's not actually in a, in a release yet where um, a, a, a stupid number of cron jobs are created to delete version transients. Yeah. I haven't been interested enough to dig in any deeper. Uh, I, can, I can point you to it. And that completely kills the site because then there's like 5,000 entries in WP options for, for cron jobs and that just... And, and, and I just, if, when and if that happens, sometimes it happens when lots of products are synced. Uh, the day-to-day -day delta coming from the product information management system is not huge, but sometimes it's big, like a whole collection is released and, and we get a lot. And that's just, I'm just waiting for that bug to be fixed in WooCommerce and we'll update. And right now, I literally, I just, I just kill FPM and I just d delete that totally brute force. It, it, it's really annoying. Although today I learned, actually, at w one of the presentations <laughs> had a couple of lines of code. Ah, maybe, maybe that would solve my problem. Uh, otherwise, performance, no, it's not really a problem. Uh, we have a medium-sized server. It's just one. We don't, we don't run a farm or anything. Uh, the, the absolute number of customers is not huge. Uh, the, the volume of business is pretty big because it's consumers, it's uh, corporate customers coming in to make large, or like for a hotel, they'll buy like a thousand towels at a time, for example. Um, we have a medium-sized server with no special, special performance-oriented configurations so far. Thank you. Now it's this guy's turn. Yeah. 
So planned, actually, it's not bad. Yes, hi. Uh, uh, in the near future, I'm building a kind of similar setup uh, with a little less products and a little less complexity. I'm, I'm going to use Polylang Pro for that, and I'm, I, I can tell the results later. But my question is really about uh, time estimates. Like, how long did it take for you to set up the plugin that synchronizes things and the WooCommerce settings and such? Because I don't want to uh, give too, yeah. too positive uh, estimates or doomsday so estimates. The in, in this context, the, the thing that has taken time is simply writing the code that uh, re the, the, the so starting from you know, SOAP clients, uh, you make a request, you, you formulate the query XML, you make the request, you get the response. Uh, the, I, was, I was almost going to draw a picture of this. You get the XML response. I have uh, domain classes in PHP to, to, to represent exactly that XML. No transformations yet into WooCommerce products. I just take the XML and I represent that in PHP, just so that I have that without SOAP client. I don't, don't actually want to talk to SOAP client. I want PHP class representations, but one-to-one -one of that XML data. From, and from there, I will then make a, uh, a, a, a kind of transformation into my own domain classes, which uh, do not follow this model, because this is how my brain works and I need to know my code. Uh, so I have um, a bunch of classes which have, for example, product, but it, it is a multilingual product. Right? When I make that super awesome library which will make me rich and famous, it'll be based on this, where I have a single class which represents an arbitrarily multilingual product. And that is then able to create this stuff into the database. And I kind of mix doing stuff directly into the database. Mostly I try to be a good citizen and I use WP functions. Sometimes I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. I'm just, and I, I kind of dive straight into the database, but then you skip filters and things. Um, doing this overall, was about two months of work, two man months, two to three man months, including, I mean, the original development was two, and then further work is another one, so the total investment in effort uh, has been approximately three man months to uh, create this synchronization that I've described. Thank you. I'm going to block you a little bit, so you can ask privately because we don't have time for Many questions. I can but, hang around for, for yeah, the but they were on the back. I think was one hand up. I think we're gonna need to have that as a last question. You can ask also privately afterwards, yeah, so we time. can come have a coffee. break, little break between the last speeches. But you can definitely ask after this. So last question goes from here. Um, uh, hello, great talk. Um, there were question about performance, um, but. Have you around with uh, Black Friday's performance and how the sync keep all the multilingual stock and stuff synced on heal like tons tons of requests per second for all the multilinguals? Um, no. <laughs> this things like Black Friday. Um, Christmas sales, Easter sales, summer sales don't apply to this particular store because it's uh, corporate customers um, and we don't get load peaks like that. It's the, the absolute load of users on the system is, is pretty low. It's a small number of users, like hundreds. Total user base is hundreds of people. That's it. Um, but because they're corporate customers, right, you think of a hotel, right, a thousand towels, or like Moomin Shop, which is a chain of stores in Finland. There's like a dozen of them around Finland. And they're, okay, now we need more, you know, Finlayson movement bath towels, you know, and buy like, I don't, I don't actually know the numbers, right? But it, it's so, you know, a few hundred people logging into this system produce millions in sales. Um, so that kind of performance issue, we don't have with this. And, and we probably will never have that problem. Thank you again. Now we kind of have to stop, so everyone can have a break. We'll be back about in 10 minutes with our last round of speaker. One more applaud for Alan. Thank you.